There's only silence, so I'm, I'm done. <laughs> um, uh, so this is a little piece that I wrote for, um, it's a journal called Daedalus, which is the Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. It's, it's aimed for the general academic public. It's not a specialist First Amendment piece. Um, but it uh, represents, I would say, my effort. I mean, I've been writing about freedom of speech for way too long. And um, finally, I decided um, in this piece to use a little Occam's razor and sort of say, well, if we really push it, where do we get? And so this is an argument, um, really, I'm throwing down a gauntlet um, to all of you to try to uh, push back against the thesis here, the thesis that I'm going to put on the table. And it's a thesis that I'm implicated in myself because I've written on the subject a lot. Um, if we ask in the First Amendment land and the freedom of expression land in the United States, we say, what is the free speech principle? And we, we have different candidates for the free speech principle. And finally, in this piece, I'm going to say, there's actually no such principle. <laughs> it's a mistake to conceptualize the problem that way. And that's distinct from asking, when should the government regulate speech? What should the government do is one thing. Is there a free speech principle? That's a different question. I think that second question really comes into focus in academic writing in the 1970s. I don't think really, if you look at the masters in the past, they would abstract it to the question of what is the principle for freedom of speech um, in the abstract. And the reason I'm writing about it now um, is because in the United States, we are, as you all know, obsessed with the question of freedom of speech. Um, and we are worried that uh, we can't talk anymore to each other. Um, if I'm on the left and I speak, I'm afraid of being canceled uh, or bullied by the right. And if I'm on the right and I want to speak, I'm afraid of being canceled by the left. And as a result, dialogue seems stultified. And that's a ground for complaint. It surely is. And the answer, which is being increasingly given in my, in my country, is, uh, well, the cure to this problem is the free speech principle. We ought to speak more. And um, this is a piece which says, well, if you misdiagnose the cause, you're going to misdiagnose the cure. The cause is not the absence of a free speech principle. The, 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 cure, the, the underlying problem, I'm going to argue, is a political one. It's that our politics have become diseased, hence our speech has become diseased. Freeing the speech isn't going to cure the politics. It's putting the cart before the horse. That's the thesis I'm going to put on the table. And I'm going to take as my text a very well-known <coughs> editorial uh, by the New York Times. So I can treat, it's called, America has a free speech problem. So you see right there, they imagine this as a free speech issue. And in his very first sentence, the New York Times, our official organ of good sense and high policy, its very first sentence, it says, Americans, I'm quoting it now, are losing hold of the fundamental right to speak their minds and voice their opinions in public without fear of being shamed or shunned. That's the problem that we need to fix. People are afraid to speak because they're afraid they're going to be um, ashamed. And its focus there is not on whether the government will suppress speech. It's focused on how we should regard each other when we speak. So it's on what I'm calling now a free speech principle. And the, um, the answer to this problem, says the New York Times, is we should rededicate ourselves to the free speech principle, more tolerance. We should allow each other to speak more. And this framing of the issue is not at all um, idiosyncratic. Um, uh, uh, many Americans would say, I, I don't know whether this would be true in Israel, but it's certainly true in the United States, um, Americans would say, we need to have more free speech. That's the, um, that's the problem. We need, um, we need more unrestrained expression. People shouldn't be self-censoring. They shouldn't have to fear being shamed or shunned. Um, and I, I think if you put it that broadly and that abstractly, it's nonsense <laughs> as a principle. Well, why would it be the case that more speech is better than less speech? I mean, think about occasions where you would actually imagine a situation where abstracting from any circumstance, you just say it's better to have more words than less words. You could think about primal screen therapy, maybe. You say, say what's on your mind. <laughs> Whatever it is, say it. That's an occasion where you want more speech. But really, in your life, think about actual occasions where you would say more speech by itself is better. I and mean, just think of a concrete situation. Think of like your, your friends with someone. You know, if, if I'm with a friend and the friend can't shut up, I'm not going to stay friends with this person. Right? You don't, a friendship isn't constituted by unrestrained speech. 
it's constituted by speech which serves friendship. So if I am completely abusive of my friend, if I don't do uh, his, uh, his confidence as well, um, that friendship is going to end. Right? Um, so I never say about, in the context of a friendship, more speech by itself is better. I'd say um, the right kind of speech is good. And when I speak in the context of a friendship, I'm just using this as emblematic of any relationship. When I speak, it's always a balance between, on the one hand, candor, unique candor in a good friendship, and on the other hand, self-restraint, discretion. And how do I strike that balance? How do I know when I should be restraining myself and when I should be speaking more? The answer is I should speak in a way that makes it a better friendship. Very simple. Right? The good of my speaking in a friendship is not the good of speech. It's the good of friendship. And the speech serves um, the friendship. And I, what I'm, what I, an argument, a very simple argument I'm going to put on the table, that's always true of speech. Everything we do as human beings, we're the speaking animal as Aristotle said. So every relationship we have, every social practice we engage in, every time we're in connection with another human being is through speech. But it's always the connection. It's not the speech. <coughs> so the good of the speech is the good of the connection that you're establishing with another person. So, you know, this is a law school. If I'm a lawyer in court, I don't get paid by the word. <laughs> it's not that I speak more, it's better. It's that I speak in a way that serves my client. I speak for the good of the relationship. Or I'm a professor of law. I don't get paid by the word. I don't say it's a better class because I talked more. Why would I say such a thing? It's a better class because it's better education. So how do I decide when to speak and when not, and when to hold my tongue, and when to listen, and when to talk, to serve the purpose of um, education? So the general argument I'm put on the table is speech is always in the context of concrete relationships. And the good of speech is not the free speech principle that the speech abstractly <coughs> considered from the relationship, but the good of the relationship in which you happen to be talking. right? So the good of my speech in a friendship is not speech, it's friendship. The good of my speech as a lawyer is not my speech, it's serving the client. The good of my speech in a classroom is not uh, is not uh, uh, my talking, it's the good of education. And it's by that metric, by the metric of the social connection that the speech is establishing, that we measure when to speak, when to restrain, when more speech is better, and when more speech is, is, uh, is not. And when we speak about speech in the abstract, when we speak about a free speech principle, we're forced into this land of, uh, um, that is, uh, abstracted away from these concrete relationships. And so if you actually look at the literature about the free speech principle, they will give abstractions like, you need free speech to have knowledge, right? In the United States, we call that the marketplace of ideas. You've probably heard that phrase. It comes from a Holmes opinion in 1919. Well, actually, if you look at where knowledge is created in the modern world, it's not by more speech, you know? Scholars don't say what's ever on their mind. If they do that, then, they, uh, then they're divas. They're not scholars. Scholars speak in very restrained, careful, disciplined ways. And in situations where you do scholarship and knowledge is created, you never see more speeches better. No scholarly journal functions on the marketplace of ideas. No department hires on the marketplace of ideas. They hire on the, on the question of better or worse scholarship which is, of course, exactly contrary to a free speech principle. The free speech principle captures the idea that if I'm going to advance knowledge, I have to be free to criticize knowledge, but it misses the idea that my speech criticizing it is of value only if it's competent. And so in the context of knowledge creation, we are always both uh, talking in ways that are, and critical in ways that are innovative and, um, and, uh, and require a certain freedom, and also disciplining ourselves. So in the context of knowledge creation, we always speak in, in the context of academic freedom. And the axis of academic freedom is not a marketplace of ideas, it's the distinction between competence and incompetence. We decide to tenure someone on the basis of competence or incompetence. We decide to hire someone based on competence versus incompetence. We decide whether to give a grant, same thing, right? So knowledge creation is not a function of freedom of speech. Freedom of speech there would be Wikipedia. Wikipedia does not create knowledge. 
influencers on the internet do not create knowledge. It's not knowledge because everyone happens to agree or it wins in the marketplace of ideas. It's knowledge because those trained to the disciplinary standards that determine knowledge decide in a community of discipline, the community of knowledgeable people, as Charles Peirce would say, decide that it's knowledge. So it's misleading to say that a free speech, that free speech is justified by the nation of knowledge. And we have the, the same issue when we speak about another value that's often on the table in the context of an abstract uh, free speech principle, um, autonomy. We say you need to speak freely in order to become a fulfilled person, to express yourself. And of course it's true. We need a certain freedom to say who we are. Uh, if we're suppressed, we feel alienated and self that's bad. But it's also true that if you only say what's on your mind and you express your autonomy all the time, you're a jerk. No one wants to be around you. Right? Our economy is always in the context of social practices, and it's limited by the social practices in which we are engaged. And the example I just gave you is, um, is uh, friendship. Right? And in any social relation, pick your social relationship. My autonomy never trumps. Never trumps. Um, in fact, what trumps is the practice. So um, uh, I'm a doctor. And I really truly believe that COVID is not caused by a virus. If I misdiagnose my patient in the service of my autonomy, I'm going to be subject to a malpractice action. I'm a lawyer. I really truly believe that taxes are illegitimate. I don't care what your autonomy is as a lawyer. You have to give competent advice. Any social relationship you pick is going to be governed by these rules like this. And autonomy, we do not permit to trump the social practice. You need autonomy to engage in the social practice. You can't be a good lawyer, a good professor, a good friend, unless you're in touch with what you're really feeling and expressing it, but always within the bounds of the practice itself. And um, we can generalize this point, and we could say, as human beings, um, we require dignity. And what is the dignity of a human being? It's that we're treated with respect. We are, uh, people act toward us according to the norms that signify respect. So, uh, you know, the sociologist Irvin Hoffman once gave the presidential address to the American Sociological Association. He writes about the norms that constitute dignity. And he says, for example, I'm following the norms, he says, addressing the, 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 the uh, meeting, the annual meeting of the American Sociological Association. I am facing you when I'm talking. But if I were to give a speech and I'm facing this way, you would say, what is going on there? You know, what is he doing? He's showing us disrespect. Same is true. Um, and this, these norms of dignity, they apply not really to action, they apply to speech, right? Uh, and if I go around violating these norms, if I go around spewing uh, uh, abuse or acting in outrageous, saying outrageous things, um, I'm, going to be, uh, uh, I'm going to be violating those norms, and everybody knows it. And everybody in a well-socialized room knows the difference between behaving well and behaving um, badly. And when I say that, you might think, well, that's obvious. But think again of that first sentence in the New York Times editorial that I read you. The New York Times said, we are losing the fundamental right to speak our minds without fear of being shamed or shunned. There is no such right. No well-organized, non-demoralized society has the right to speak in a way in which you won't be shamed or shunned. If you act in a way that deserves being shamed, if you spew abuses, you will be shamed. And that's appropriate. That's how a society maintains its identity. That's how we maintain dignity among ourselves. So it's literally nonsense what the, what the New York Times is saying. But it's saying it because it's under the spell of the free speech principle. That's, and it leads to absurdities um, like that. Now, does it follow from what I'm saying that, uh, let's say, um, many centuries, decades of thinking about the free speech principle has been completely uh, useless? No, I don't think so. Um, and that's because there's one social practice that's very unique to modernity, which I haven't talked about, which I think is the foundation from which we generalize our, this misleading notion of freedom of speech. And the nature of that practice is signified in the New York Times editorial um, when it says, we should be free to speak our minds, and I'm quoting now, in public. So what does this little phrase mean, in public? It's seemingly innocuous, but actually it refers to a very discreet and important social practice, the practice of participating in the public sphere. So the idea of public speech 
goes back, of course, to classical Greece and to Rome, but it changed its nature altogether with the invention of printing in the 16th um, century. And the printing press gave rise to an entirely new form of social organization, which we now call the public sphere. And what we now call the public, the public emerged within the public sphere, and it was created, I'm quoting now Michael Warner, by the circulation of texts among strangers who become, by virtue of their reflexively circulating discourse, a social entity. And you think about this idea of the public, it's actually a remarkable construction. We anthropomorphize the public. We say, the public is outraged. The public wants to know. The public is curious, right? The public demands. We, you see those sentences every day in the newspaper. Well, what is this thing, this, this public? This thing, this public, that emerges with the creation of printing and media which circulate communication to large numbers of strangers, media like museums or like newspapers, and to speak in public is to address the strangers who participate in and create the public um, sphere. And in our own time, this is what the subject of discussion was yesterday, we have a whole new virtual public sphere, which is working in a digitized atmosphere, not the analog atmosphere of museums or newspapers. And what we call public opinion, right? Public opinion, this idea of public opinion, it is what emerges from um, the public um, sphere. And this idea of public opinion, which is a relatively new idea, and only a few centuries old, this idea of public opinion facilitates entirely new forms of governance. In fact, when we speak about democracy and define democracy, the best definition of democracy, it's about you know, a little bit more than a century old now, is government by public opinion. You know, Bryce talks about it that way, the American progressives talked about it that way. And from this perspective, the public is, in the words of Michael Schutzen, the the media scholar, the public is the fiction that brings self-government to life. You can't have a democracy until you have a public, and you can't have a public until you have these media for the communication of ideas until the invention of printing in the 16th century. So public discourse is the medium through which public opinion is um, created, and it serves a very distinct function. Um, what happened with the development of printing was that the church lost its epistemological authority. You had, you had a century and a half of civil war, civil disturbance through the Reformation, and the function of the state is developed at that time. We, we, we get great centralized states, and as Hobbes instructs us in the middle of the 17th century, the function of the state is to make you secure so that you don't die a short and brutish death. Um, in, these, in, the, in the wars of the Reformation, life itself became insecure. So we needed a centralized state which succeeds to feudalism as a result of the dist epistemological disturbances which are caused by the printing press, this new means of um, communication. And this new centralized state of the 17th century is so successful that by the next century, by the 18th century, it has created a robust civil society that is accustomed to peace, that is engaged in deuce commerce, that you know, is now engaged in the, what we would call the marketplace. And it has, as its project, the control of the violence of this new centralized state that emerges in the 17th century. And the strategy during the age of constitutionalism in the late 18th century is to say, we want to control the violence of the centralized state by subjecting it to politics. We want to exercise political control over the violence of the centralized state. So how do we do that? Um, well, what is politics? What does it mean to exercise political control? Politics, in the words of Anna Arendt, um, shifts the emphasis, I'm quoting her now, from action to speech, and to speech as a means of persuasion. To be political, Arendt says, is to reach decisions through words and persuasion, and not through force and violence. So the upshot is that for modern societies, the basic strategy has been to use this new development, the public sphere, to exercise political control over the newly created centralized state. That's what happens in the 17th century with the invention of newspapers, 18th century, I should say. Um, and this is what we inherit as what it means to speak in public. We participate in the formation of public opinion to the end that we can subject the centralized state in my country, in Washington, DC, to political accountability. 
meaning to accountability to those who participate in public discourse to form um, public opinion. And that's the basic structure of what our First Amendment is. Our First Amendment um, seeks to protect the public sphere in a society in which, to quote from Justice Jackson, public authority is controlled by public opinion and does not control public opinion. So it's public opinion which is the source of sovereignty, it's the source of self-government, and this is a communicative structure in the public um, sphere. And this is what accounts for, in, the, in our First Amendment doctrine, this very curious separation of speech from action, which is quite distinct from the way in which we normally um, live a life. And if you look at this New York Times editorial, they're very much under the sway of, we need to speak freely, because otherwise we can't govern ourselves. We don't know what public issues we want to address. We don't know, you know whether we should uh, have more immigration or less, or higher tariffs or less, unless we can talk in terms of a very common idea that the freedom of speech is there to serve what we call democratic self-governance. But what it really means is we can participate in the formation of public opinion and make the state um, accountable to it. And in, if you look at it from um, this point of view, it's really not about free speech. What I've just said to you is that the public sphere is a practice, it's a social practice, a highly abstract one, in which we engage for a social purpose namely to ensure the political accountability of the state. It's not that we have speech for speech purposes when we speak in public. It's rather we are participating in a practice that goes back to the 18th century, which is to use the public sphere to create political um, accountability. And from this perspective, it's very interesting that the arguments that we make for the free speech principle actually describe pretty well what it means to have a public sphere. In this, in, on this story. So if I say it's necessary for the creation of knowledge, no, it's not necessary for the creation of knowledge. But it is true <coughs> that the marketplace of ideas metaphor describes pretty accurately the ongoing, never ceasing, bubbling up of public opinion, which is the source of, of um, political accountability. It does describe the process by which public opinion continuously and endlessly emerges within the public sphere. The marketplace of ideas does that. Or if I ask about autonomy, Right? I'm not autonomous in anything I do, I'm not king, but when we participate in the public sphere, we are the sovereigns, because we are exercising political control over the state. So when I am participating in the public sphere, the state should view me as autonomous. That makes a, a fair amount of sense. Right? So the theories that we have developed for a free speech principle, in the abstract free speech, actually describe a lot of what's going on of, uh, with regard to speech within the public um, sphere. Um, but on the other hand, what they do is they occlude the fact that we are engaging in that for a social purpose. The practice has a reason. <coughs> the reason of the practice is the democratic accountability of the state. And when we conceptualize public discourse from the point of view of a free speech principle, we miss that fact. We say the public sphere is more healthy when everyone gets to talk. Maybe yes, maybe no. Right? In my country, if everybody talks, but the rich govern public opinion, and the rest of the population thinks, gee, you know, public opinion doesn't reflect me, so the state is not accountable to me, it's accountable to the rich people, that would be a failure of the practice. And yet it would be invisible if you imagine the practice to be about free speech, full stop, as opposed to speech to create a public sphere to create political accountability. And this accounts for many of the, let's say, pretty bad opinions about freedom of speech that my Supreme Court um, has made. They've missed the fact that the speech, even in the public sphere, is there to serve a particular um, purpose. So the balance between freedom and restraint is to be determined, just like it is in friendship, just like it is in the practice of law, by the good of the relevant practice. The good of the relevant practice in public discourse is the political accountability of the state to the population. And for that reason, tolerance is a pretty good rule of thumb. The more we speak, the more people feel involved, the more they have a stake in democratic self-governance, that's a good thing. And that's why, as a general matter, we think of the, from the participation in the public sphere under the sign of freedom. But if you only think it under the sign of freedom, you're missing half the problem. Because the other half of the problem is it needs to it, it fulfill its function, which is the political accountability of the state. And um, you see that in the New York Times editorial. Because the issue is, um, for public discourse in my country now, isn't that people aren't speaking freely. 
It's rather that public discourse is no longer assuring public accountability. Why? Because we're not speaking to each other. We're speaking against each other. We have um, increasingly, in my country, politics has, um, has morphed into Carl Schmitt's concept of politics. Remember Carl Schmitt? He said, what's politics? Politics is about the distinction between friends and enemies. So if I have a political relationship to you, it's existential. I want to destroy you. In the last election, 2000, 2016 election in my country, <coughs> the famous essay, The Flight 93 Election, in which Michael Anton from the Claremont Institute, the right wing institute, um, said this is the Flight 93 election. Flight 93 was when the hijackers took over, wanted to fly into the Pentagon, the passengers stormed it and brought it down. He said, you storm the cockpit or you die, he said. It was a very famous essay from the 2000. Now, that is a statement of Schmidian politics. That's a statement of politics as existentially uh, 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 friend enemy. If you have that, Schmidt had it wrong all the way down to the ground. If you have that, you do not have a political relationship. What you have is a war. And the disease of politics, the reason people aren't talking, is that we're turning into friends and enemies. And a political relationship is when you have a relationship with someone else where something is more important than any particular disagreement you have. Unless you have that, you can't be in a political relationship where it's just words. You, you displace your disagreements into words when there's something more at stake than any particular disagreement. I would call that, I call it PSA, a common fate. Some notion of common destiny is a you know, pure definition of a nation state where we're all in this together. We're in the same boat or we're not in the same boat. If we're not in the same boat, we have civil war. If we are in the same boat, we can disagree and b abide by the rules of the game, which define politics versus war. That's a political relationship, in my view. And the problem that the New York Times is putting its finger on, that we can't talk to each other, is really about the disease of the politics, not the disease of speech. So it may be, if we all want to talk more, we can solve this problem, but I tend to think not. Because if we talk in the wrong ways to each other, if we talk to each other that reinscribes a Schmidian concept of politics, we won't have solved the problem. We'll have entrenched the problem. So to get out of this dilemma, one needs to think of how you cure your politics, how you reinstill a sense of common destiny where actually, you know, when you see the demonstrations um, on Saturday night, they had a flag, and the flag meant we're, you know, there's something bigger than this demonstration. We're together in this. That's what a flag stands for in a country. You know? That there's something that unites underneath all of the disagreement, which is more or less superficial. So how you do that? That's a matter of restructuring your politics in particular ways. I mean, I have a lot of theses, but that's going to be, you know, that's going to be country specific, path dependent, historical, et cetera, et cetera. But you misdiagnose the problem if you imagine it's a free speech problem and not as a problem of politics, of the social practice, of the construction of the political sphere to hold the state accountable. So stop there. <laughs> Thank you.